Jesus led them out of the city as far as Bethany, and then he raised his hands and blessed them, and then he departed. Today we mark the ascension of Christ Jesus. He went up, says the scripture. You know, as far as the calendar goes, this is kind of a transition Sunday. It's the Sunday between the end of Easter and the beginning of Pentecost which will be next week. On a more pro profound level, today marks the transition between the earthly ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Christ in the life of the church. The scripture records that Jesus carried forward God's ministry right to the cross. He was loyal to the end. Then there was the resurrection, and then the Holy Spirit empowered the disciples to carry forward Jesus' ministry of reconciliation and love right up to today. That ministry continues to go on here at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ here in Moline. We are in continuity. The account of the ascension in, in some ways is not as dramatic as it might be. If you remember um, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus all lived in Bethany. And when Jesus was in the area of Jerusalem, he would stay with them. They offered him hospitality. And then um, he could walk from there uh, to Jerusalem. And how many times had he, had he walked then back home again? He'd gone from Jerusalem, then down into the valley, and up again through the Mount of Olives that we hear so much about. And when you get to the Mount of Olives, you just make a little right turn, and there's a, a road uh, that goes to Bethany, the whole the whole walk wouldn't be more than 30 minutes. He'd probably done it many, many times uh, with the disciples. And so on this particular day, when he got as far as Bethany, he raised his hand, he blessed them, and he departed. And then they did not see him in the same way anymore. The writer of Luke Acts um, I think he could have been an accountant. He liked to get things really tidy so that uh, he has the resurrection and then there are 40 days and there's the ascension and then on the 50th day is the day of Pentecost where the gift of the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in the life of the church. For the writer of John, it was much quicker. If you remember back to the Doubting Thomas story, uh, Jesus uh, has talked to Thomas, and he said, go for it, Thomas. You can put your fingers, uh, your finger here or in my hand, or you can put your hand in my side. And then he turns, and he says to the disciples there in the room, he says, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I authorize you to be the continuity of my work here on earth. So John has it happening in a week. Luke has it happening in 40 days. For Paul, it's all about the resurrection appearances, and you can find that in 1 Corinthians 15 if you want to be a real Bible scholar. And he mentions that at one point Jesus appeared to as many as 400 people all at the same time. And then he goes on to say, and last of all, as one untimely born, he, he appeared to me. So if you will, he is equating his experience on the road to Damascus with the appearance that Jesus made to the 12 after Easter you know, maybe John is a little quick, and Paul is a little long, and as Goldilocks said, and Luke gets it just right. 
Why talk about it at all? Well, first off, the ascension answers the question of why is it that we, we don't see Jesus in the same way that they did right after the resurrection, right after Easter. Second, and I think this is probably the most important, the ascension empowers Jesus' followers to carry on and yet to act independently and to use some of their own imagination along with the guidance of the Spirit in carrying forth Christ's ministry in the world. No one would have ever been asked to say grace at any church meeting except Jesus if he'd stayed around. Who could do it better? Ah, better ask Jesus. No one had a more inside track to God. By ascending, Jesus truly left his life in the hands of his followers. Jesus entrusted us with his very life. Let me say that again. Jesus entrusted us with his very life. It's up to us, empowered by the Holy Spirit, by putting his life and mission into our collective hands, Christ becomes incarnate in many cultures. There is so much more diversity. Christ speaks hundreds of human languages. Christ has a face or of many colors and genders. The mission has more folks all working at the same time on the same mission. And goodness knows it has a much wider scope than just there in Jerusalem or in Bethany. And third, and maybe where it connects with us in our daily life as well as the life of the mission of the church. And could be stretching it here. But the ascension enables us to evaluate transitions, particularly painful transitions, in our life in a new light. There are a lot of transitions thrust upon us that we simply wish would go away. Who among us would have wanted Jesus to leave had we had the choice. But you may think of some transitions in your life that you really would have preferred you didn't have to work your way through. When I think of the big transitions in the life of the church, I think of folks who've had to change their residences because their life circumstances change especially those in the aging process, of which I become ever more keenly aware, uh, who are unable to remain living independently in their own home. And I have found that some who resisted it the most seem to go on to living better because they ate better meals and actually had more people to talk to and they got along better, but they didn't like it. They sort of went kicking and screaming. There are happy transitions, like being promoted from one grade to the next, and we'll have some of those in the next few weeks. And young people graduating from high school and going off to college, and it's all bittersweet, and we think, don't go, we love you. Stay with us. And yet we, we know they have to move on. And we ache for them a little because we know that they will ultimately succeed. But there will be bumps along the road. And we want to be with them and to give them comfort. And we can't because that's part of the point of going on on their own. 
There are transitions marked with churchly ceremonies or ordinations, installations of new pastors, anniversaries of congregation and of churches. And the beat goes on. And we've been here for 175 years, not any of us individually, but collectively we've been here that long at First Church. And we keep going through transitions in mission and in ministry. Sometimes at church meetings, uh, pastors are honored for years of service. They even occasionally have somebody sing them happy birthday, which is all good. This year, Pastor Craig is going up to Wisconsin. God bless him. Truly, God bless you on your way. In the last few weeks, we've uh, chatted occasionally and laughed about the work that it takes to get it together to make the move and make the transition. Boxes, planning, calling. I'm sure he wishes he could just lift up his hands and bless, make a blessing, and that would be that, but he's soldiering forward. It is a comfort in life transitions to be able to do them in the company of others who know us and who love us. And while they are painful, often they're good things too. And in all of these transitions, we want to be honored, respected, have dignity, and some degree of sharing in shaping our own future. And while we may not relish some of the transitions we have to make, we expect and in fact know that our family, our friends, and our God will be with us even when the transition is complete. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.